Welcome to the press conference for the Johnson County Emergency Operations Center for Tuesday, April 21st. I'm Kelly Andreessen, Public Information Officer for Johnson County. A thank you to those in the media reporting on this today and to our community partners who are participating and to all those uh, in our community who are listening to our live stream today. Uh, just a few reminders, we are streaming this live on Iowa City City Channel 4's YouTube page and on the Johnson County Public Health Facebook page. We are practicing social distancing, so we have limited the number of people in the room. And for those purposes, uh, we have a few people participating on Zoom, and then we also do have some speakers who I will be bringing in one at a time. They'll make their statement, and then we'll open it up for questions for that person. Uh, and for reporters, if you do have any follow-up questions with an individual that we didn't get to or, or you didn't get to us, uh, please touch base with me after the press conference and we'll connect you. Uh, we are taking questions from reporters virtually. Uh, thank you for your patience and your flexibility. Uh, we are, we're learning something new every day and trying something new every day, so we appreciate it. Uh, we are starting things off a little differently today. Uh, we'll be starting with a statement from Peter Nkumu, who is president of the Congolese community. He will be offering up some comments to the Congolese and general African uh, community here in, in our area. And he will be providing uh, statements in English, Lingala, and French. Uh, so with that, we will get things kicked off and I will bring Peter in. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Nkumu. I am one of uh, African leaders, especially Congolese community uh, of Iowa. And today I have three statements that I'm going to read to you in three languages. I'm going to start with English, and then I will be reading the same statement in Lingala, which is one of our uh, African language. And then I will also read one in French. Okay, so English now. Uh, we know that there are many questions in our community related to the coronavirus or COVID-19. And we want everyone to know that the health department and our local hospitals, UIHC and Mercy, are working closely with the African Communities Network and the other communities organization to address your concern. So in a week or so, there will be a Facebook Live event that will be hosted by the Congolese Health Partnership. Uh, we don't have all the details right now, but if in the future, we hope to have the details in our website of the Congolese Health Partnership, which is uh, uh, www.congolese, uh, I'm sorry, uh, one second. <laughs> I'm going to read the, the, email, uh, the address again. It is www.chp, which stands for Congolese Health Partnership, Iowa.org. Sorry about that. So that's where you can get more details about uh, this Facebook Live event. So now I'm going to say the same message in Lingala. Mbote nabino bandeko nangaya komunote Congolese. Ngai wabino President Peter Nkumu, ba konzinabiso ya santé publique awa na Johnson County, ba sengi ngai na pesa bino message oyo. Departement ya santé publique elongona hôpital ya Université ya Iowa, ya hôpital pe ya Merci, pe na komunote ya biso ba Afrikien, nyonso awa, pe na ba organisme ya mousus komunote ya tuzana bangu awa, Bazali ko bongisa likita. To evenema muke oyo eko salema en direct na Facebook ya Congolese Health Partnership. Na poso eko ya to poso mibale pona ko ya nola mituna na bino oyo bozana yango na oyo etali makambo ya bokono oyo ya coronavirus to COVID-19. French. Bonjour, chers frères et sœurs de la communauté congolaise, en particulier et africaine en général. Mon nom c'est Peter Nkumu, président de la communauté congolaise, et je suis aussi membre d'une association dénommée 
African Community Network. Je viens ici pour vous livrer un message important. En fait, le département de la santé publique de Johnson County travaille en collaboration avec l'hôpital de l'Université d'Iowa, l'hôpital Merci d'Iowa City, l'Association des communautés, euh, des communautés africaines, ainsi que certains organismes communautaires de la place pour organiser un forum live qui sera sur Facebook de Congolese Health Partnership dans les jours à venir, où on va répondre aux questions qui vous, qui vous préoccupent en ce moment concernant le virus COVID-19. Pour savoir plus sur certains détails de ce forum, visitez le, le site web de Congolese Health Partnership www.chpiowa.org. Merci. All right, thank you, Peter, for that message. Uh, and now we will switch over to our Zoom participants. Uh, Dr. Teresa Brennan, Chief Medical Officer, University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. Hi, Dr. Brennan, how are you doing today? I'm good, I'm good. how are you? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, a couple quick updates. So um, as of midnight last night, we had uh, 33 adult inpatients who were COVID positive and uh, one COVID-19 pediatric inpatient. Um, that gives calendar year-to-date numbers of 92 for adult inpatients and three for pediatric inpatients. That's year-to-date from the start of the outbreak until now. Um, I also wanted to give a quick update on PPE and um, face coverings for our employees. Um, so uh, as you know, we have uh, completed face shield distribution to all of our faculty and staff uh, who are working um, on site, either on our campus or uh, at any of our healthcare locations. Um, we believe that the face shield is the best protection for our employees. Um, it, is, it gives a solid barrier covering the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, um, and uh, it prevents people from touching their face. Um, it's also reusable and can, can be easily and frequently cleaned um, throughout the day. Um, we have purchased many of these face shields, but um, have had hundreds of donors um, that have made face shields for us, um, and we are uh, very grateful for that. Um, in compliance with the CDC's late, latest recommendations about all employees on a healthcare campus having a face covering, um, we are beginning uh, today to have all of our employees who have a face-to-face -face interaction with patients um, use a medical grade mask in addition to their face shield. Um, for those staff who do not come in contact with patients um, during their day, uh, we will allow them to be wearing cloth masks. Um, many of our employees have cloth masks of their own, um, but some do not, and because of that, um, we are looking to increase our supply and um, would be very grateful and, and welcome uh, donations from the public. Um, information about how to donate can be found on our website, uihc.org. Um, again, we are so appreciative of the community and how the community has risen up um, and helped us and our employees and our patients to get through this outbreak. Um, we are so grateful. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Uh, and we do have some remote questions from the press and I'll read them in the order that, that we received them. Uh, the first one is from Zach Smith from the Press Citizen. Have there been any changes to the pr process hospitals are using to decide whether a patient receives a COVID-19 test? And please enumerate what that decision-making process is currently. Um, we have a number of testing guidelines uh, for patients. Um, we have not changed those in the last several days. Um, they are based on the patient's symptoms, are in line with the Iowa Department of Public Health and the CDC. Um, we also offer an opportunity for uh, our uh, physicians uh, to uh, test when people are, don't fit the guidelines. Um, those tests are done um, uh, based on the availability of testing and are really a small number of the tests that we perform. 
Um, in addition, we have been testing patients who are asymptomatic who are going to undergo procedures that could have a potential for aerosol generation, which would put our faculty and staff at risk as they're taking care of those patients. So those asymptomatic patients are tested um, within the 24 hour period prior to undergoing their procedure. Another question from Zach Smith. If I think I have COVID, but I'm not terribly sick, will I be able to get a test from UIHC? And were such cases tested in the past or just for inpatients? Yeah, the guidelines, um, that's a good question, Zach. So the guidelines um, really differentiate uh, patients who are at highest risk um, and uh, uh, patients who have symptoms. Um, and so if you have symptoms, um, the recommendation would be that you, if you wanted to be tested at UIHC, that you go through a video clinic where they would evaluate what your symptoms are um, and your other medical conditions um, and determine whether you fit into those guidelines of, of um, the ability to be tested. Next, we have a question from Michael O'Brien with KCRG. What are your thoughts and what does the preparation timeline look like in regards to responding to a second wave of the virus? Yeah, it's a really good question. So there's lots of conversation nationally about um, second waves. Um, those conversations uh, really are about opening up the government, opening up our uh, healthcare facilities and what that would mean. Uh, we have a, a surge plan that has been um, built and um, we are ready to take care of patients, whether that is within the first wave or the second wave. Uh, now we have a few questions from Kate Payne with Iowa Public Radio. Has UIHC had to furlough workers or reduce pay as Unity Point has done? Um, at this point, we have not. Uh, another question from Kate. Is there anything else you can tell us about how the outbreaks at regional meat processing plants are impacting UIHC and surge capacity in Johnson County? Um, what I can tell you is that um, patients choose to get their health care um, at uh, the facility of their choice. Um, and if those patients choose to get their health care with us, um, certainly we would we would take care of them. Um, and then remember, um, one thing to remember is that most patients do not require hospitalization with COVID-19. Um, and um, if the patient requires, if the patient comes to us for their health care and they have COVID-19, um, no, no matter uh, where they acquired it, they would be enrolled in our home health treatment program. One more question from Kate. For the UIHC employees who have tested positive, can you tell us about how they're doing and their health outcomes? Uh, I don't have any specific data. Um, those, those people are our patients, just like any other patient, and we um, would respect their privacy. All right, we have a question from Travis Brees with KWWL. Has UIHC considered COVID-19 testing for uninsured patients and how much does the test cost out of pocket? And if so, would the university cover any of those costs? Um, we are testing patients no matter their payer. Um, I don't have uh, specific information regarding the cost of uh, the, um, the test, um, but we could certainly follow up with you uh, if, if you can provide information after the, the briefing. All right, a few questions uh, from Sarah Watson with The Daily Iowan. Could you give us any updates on how many staff members have tested positive for COVID-19 and precautions staff are taking? Looks like we're a little frozen. We will try and figure things out. I apologize for the technical difficulties. It 
it looks like we are experiencing some difficulties on Dr. Brennan's end, potentially. Uh, so at this point, we will shift to... Uh, oh, it's just me. Um, uh, it's just me. Okay. Um, if you're unfrozen now, could you repeat the Looks like you're back. Great. Okay. So the question is, could you give us any I updates? Can hear you now. Okay, great. <laughs> could you give us any updates on how many staff members have tested positive for COVID-19 and precautions staff are taking? Sure. Um, so uh, uh, yesterday we had two additional employees. That gives us a total of 68 employees to date. Um, this is dating back to the onset of the outbreak um, in uh, the end of February, early March. Um, uh, we are taking uh, full precautions uh, for everyone. Um, we believe that as community transmission has increased um, that we need to take these precautions no matter where our employees are. When they are on site, they are wearing face masks. And um, as I said earlier, as of today, sorry, face shields. And as I said earlier today, um, we are uh, beginning to uh, roll out uh, face masks as well. So those, those who are in patient contact will be wearing medical masks in addition to their face shield. Um, and uh, those that do not contact with do not have contact with patients will be uh, wearing cloth masks as they are available. We continue to stress um, cleaning, hand washing, um, social distancing in order to, to keep our faculty and staff safe. Great. Uh, two more questions from Sarah with the Daily Iowan. The AP reported that the UI had entered a contract with the state to develop a COVID-19 model and that the results of which were intended for internal use and not for distribution until 2021 unless approved by the state epidemiologist. Could you tell us more about the reason to wait to publish those models? I am not aware of this contact, contract. Um, this was asked actually last week as well. Um, I don't know if that contract was with the hospital or the university, to, um, but uh, as an employee of the university hospital, I'm not aware of that contract. One last question from Sarah. Is UIHC exploring antibody testing? And if so, what is the importance of antibody testing and where are you at in that process? We are exploring antibody testing. Um, we are considering it for uh, use, um, clinical use, and also for research use. Um, as you know, and as you've heard recently in the media, there are patients who um, have been exposed to and have developed antibodies to COVID-19 without developing any symptoms. Um, so the serologic test or the antibody test really looks at whether a person has had that exposure and then developed antibodies to, to COVID-19. Um, we believe that that means that they have some immunity. Um, we don't really know at this point in time what that immunity consists of, whether it's long-term, whether it's short-term, whether it's full immunity or partial immunity, um, but um, the serologic test would, um, would tell us whether those antibodies exist in that patient. Um, we are in the process of de developing um, and acquiring the equipment to be able to do this. Great. Uh, it looks like we haven't received any additional questions, but as you know, we have a little bit of a lag in the video feed. Uh, so we'll just give it a couple seconds and see if we get any additional questions. Sure, sure. no problem. All right. It looks like we have no further questions. Once again, thank you, Dr. Brennan. We really appreciate you participating today. You bet. Stay safe, you all. Thanks. And now we will uh, move on to Margaret Reese, Public Information Officer for Mercy, Iowa City. Hey, Margaret. Hello, Kelly. Hi, Hi, how are, how are you? you? Good. How are you? I'm well, thank, well, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here, kind of. Uh, I can't see you, but I know you're out there. I just want to remind uh, everybody again that prevention is critical and it's one thing that each one of us can do to help all of our providers, neighbors, friends, family, colleagues, and community by doing our part to keep others safe. So 
As of 8 a.m. today, Mercy, uh, Iowa City had eight patients, uh, inpatients who had tested positive for COVID-19 and were here for that reason, and six who were awaiting results of their tests uh, as inpatients. And this is day 44 of Mercy's COVID-19 response. This week, we began a new process to disinfect our N95 masks using germicidal irradiation or UV lights to extend the usage of those critical uh, N95 masks. And we plan to dis disinfect these after each shift in which they are worn to provide another layer of protection for our staff. This initiative was undertaken by one of our physicians in collaboration with uh, a couple of faculty members in the UI College of Engineering, uh, which is just another example of the community coming together at this time to find solutions to problems and to critical shortages. Mercy is also now enrolled uh, in the Mayo Clinic Convalescent Plasma for the Treatment of Patients with COVID-19 program, which is a research study to see if plasma from someone who has recovered from COVID-19 has substances that could improve the chances of recovery for someone else. Uh, so only patients who were hospitalized for COVID-19 and are referred by their healthcare provider, provider will participate in this protocol. Um, Mercy is now part of the Mayo Clinic IRB or Institutional Review Board. Um, this is very recent for us, so we are working through the details and protocols, but uh, it, it's very hopeful and, and, and we hope that this will make a difference for some of our patients. Our health coaches uh, who typically follow up and are still following up with all of the, the patients who are in our accountable care organization are also following up by phone every three days with every patient who has been discharged as an inpatient with positive COVID-19 diagnosis. And this is to make sure that their condition remains stable or is improving. And our Mercy on Call nurses, and that is our 24 seven nurse triage uh, uh, service, follows up by phone with anyone who has tested positive and is discharged from our emergency care unit. So they come uh, and they are seen in the tent outside the emergency care room. They are diagnosed as, have, as being positive for COVID-19, but are discharged back to home uh, to recover there. And again, they are contacting those patients every three days as well to follow up with them in their condition. We would like to thank everyone in the community for the many, many donations of cloth masks, other supplies and meals for our employees. We appreciate these contributions and we appreciate the continued donations of cloth masks and gowns. We are now supplying masks to patients who present for care in the hospital. They may be coming for an appointment in the lab or radiology. They're coming to maternal child to deliver. Uh, they have surgery that cannot wait. Uh, they're in the emergency room and so forth. And to the visitors who come who screen negative for COVID-19 because we still allow one healthy adult uh, to visit a patient. We can have one in the building at one time as long as they screen negative. Um, it is, um, also something that we have done to make sure that all of our patients or our, our colleagues who work with patients or within six feet of a patient have face shields. And we have made many of these ourselves. We received some donations, but we've made 1,200 of them ourselves. And that's true in the hospital and in the clinics. And uh, we also are strongly encouraging our colleagues who are uh, not in patient facing positions um, within the hospital and in the clinics to wear cloth masks when they are here and also to continue that um, behavior when they are not here. Uh, so in the community as well to wear those cloth masks. Uh, and again, we are encouraging people always to stay calm and to stay home and to practice that social distancing, uh, to wear a cloth mask when you are out in public, uh, to wash your hands and clean surfaces often and follow all of the precautions uh, because by doing so, you are making a positive difference in slowing this virus for everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Margaret, uh, we have a question from Amy Bro with the Press Citizen. Have staff at Mercy expressed concerns about the amount of PPE they are provided by the hospital? And if so, how are these concerns addressed? 
Uh, PPE and making sure that we have an adequate supply is uh, a primary uh, issue and cause for us. Uh, and I am not aware of any complaints of that nature. And we are working extremely hard to have what we need and to have the appropriate quantities in the right places at the right time. Uh, and have done many things uh, to preserve PPE, such as asking for those cloth masks from the community, uh, now making some isolation gowns of, on our own uh, from sterile wrap. We have uh, colleagues who have volunteered and have made several hundred of those and they can be laundered. Uh, uh, now disinfecting our, our N95 masks so we can continue to use those and following every um, possible avenue that we have to secure the supplies that we need. So uh, we feel um, um, cautiously optimistic that we have uh, what we need available. Uh, a few questions from Zach Smith with the Press Citizen. Have there been any changes to the process Mercy is using to decide whether a patient receives a COVID-19 test? And please enumerate what that decision-making process is currently. We continue, uh, as Teresa Brennan said, to follow the guidelines of the Iowa Department of Public Health and the CDC, and we would screen every patient or everybody who, who presents uh, to see if they uh, meet the criteria for a test. And it's not that you are deliberately excluding uh, people from having the test, but it is the availability of tests. Uh, we only receive each week so many swabs or every other week uh, for testing. And if those are gone, they are gone and we can't test anyone else. So continuing to follow the guidelines of IDPH and the CDC, uh, which is what all other hospitals are doing as well, is absolutely critical to make sure that we have what we need available for people who, who really need it. Because again, uh, most individuals who have, uh, who test positive or would test positive uh, for COVID-19 are able to recover at home. And there is a large number of people who aren't even aware uh, that they have been infected and they get over it without really any symptoms at all. Um, so uh, we follow the criteria to make sure that we are testing those individuals who are at highest risk. One more question from Zach. If I think I have COVID, but I'm not terribly sick, will I be able to get a test from Mercy? And were such cases tested in the past or just for inpatients? No, we test uh, people who never become inpatients, but you need to be screened before you can be tested. And that's true everywhere. Uh, and so we would ask you to call your provider and discuss with them over the phone your symptoms and they would decide whether or not you needed to be tested and then direct you to the appropriate location. And if a person does not have a provider, then we would encourage you to call our Mercy on Call a nurse triage uh, system and, and they would link you up with the provider. But a person needs to have a medical order in order to have a test. Uh, we have a few questions from Kate Payne with Iowa Public Radio. Has Mercy had to furlough workers or reduce pay as Unity Point has done? We have not, not at this, this time, time no. no. Uh, also from Kate, is there anything else you can tell us about how the outbreaks at regional meat processing plants are impacting Mercy and surge capacity in Johnson County? Uh, we are not aware of uh, any dramatic impact. We know that there have been patients referred to our drive up testing and acute respiratory clinic or the ARC uh, for tests, but I am not aware of numbers or anything like that. What we have done is for our uh, Mercy Family Medicine Clinic in Columbus Junction is to deliver PPE uh, testing swabs uh, and uh, uh, supported them with an additional provider. Um, but uh, we are not aware of a, a, a large influx um, um, of need at this time. Uh, one more question from Kate. Uh, for any Mercy employees who have tested positive, can you tell us about how they're doing and their health outcomes? Uh, we have had uh, four since the beginning. Uh, we believe that those have been community spread. They have all, they are all recovering at home uh, or have recovered at home. Uh, and that's, that's, that's that. Uh, we have a question from Travis Brees from KWWL. Uh, UIHC doctors told us recently they want to get each one of their inpatients on one of the possible vaccines they're testing. 
does Mercy also want to get as many people as possible on plasma treatment, or will there be a control group to test its effectiveness? Well, as I said, we have just recently uh, enrolled in the Mayo Clinic convalescent plasma for the treatment of patients with COVID-19 research study and within just the last couple of days. So that's very new to us. And if it is an appropriate treatment and if a patient uh, meets the criteria and if the plasma is available, we will absolutely um, um, want to administer that as appropriate. And a follow-up question from Travis related to that. Does Mercy feel that it will get enough plasma donations for that treatment? Uh, the donation of plasma, again, is uh, it's, it's not a um, totally simple thing. Uh, it's not complicated. However, patients who are eligible to donate plasma uh, must be symptom-free for two weeks following uh, their testing of testing positive, and that test must be confirmed by their provider. Uh, a positive test result is not adequate. It needs to be confirmed by their provider. And then the patient's provider must uh, invite them and refer them uh, if they are appropriate for the plasma study to donate plasma. Um, and there are protocols to follow and a process for this. And we are working through the details because as I said, this is very new to us. Uh, but patients who have um, tested positive are symptom free for two weeks. The test is confirmed by their provider and they're appropriate to be referred, uh, you know, if all those things fall into place, uh, then it is possible for them to donate the plasma. Uh, we have a question from Sarah Watson with The Daily Iowan. Uh, do you have an estimate of how many tests you're conducting in a week at Mercy? I do not have an estimate of how many we are conducting uh, in a week at Mercy. I can tell you that since this began, we have uh, tested a total of 150 who have been positive, uh, the vast majority of whom have uh, recovered or are recovering at home. Uh, so we have done hundreds because it seems that about 10% of the tests that we conduct uh, end up uh, with a positive result. Uh, that's just an estimate, um, but I don't know the total number so far. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any qu additional questions, but again, because of the video lag, we're going to give it a couple of seconds to see if we get any more. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like we have not received any additional questions. Thank you, Margaret, for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you Kelly. Kelly. Thank you, everybody. All right, now we have Sam Jarvis, Community Health Manager with Johnson County Public Health. Good afternoon. Uh, short statements today, um, but this week has been proclaimed National Volunteer Week, and we wanted to take a moment to thank everyone and all of our volunteers in the county and everyone else stepping up to assist their friends, families, and neighbors. The past several weeks have been and will continue to be challenging for everyone as we continue to stay at home. But the outpouring amount of support and volunteerism we have in our area is amazing. So thank you to everyone who's helping out in every way that they can. Today, our Johnson County numbers uh, state that we've got 303 confirmed cases, uh, with 106 of those individuals recovered to date. Uh, and with that, I will take any questions. This question is from Amy at the Press Citizen. Does Johnson County Public Health recommend that schools and universities remain closed for the fall? Right now, it's pretty early to make those decisions, and we would look towards our state partners to determine that. This is a question from Michael O'Brien. 
<clears throat> what are your thoughts and what does it uh, what does the preparation timeline look like in regards to the response for a potential second wave of this virus? Uh, at this moment, it's hard to say, um, but today we noticed uh, or we saw that the governor announced Test Iowa, and so enhanced testing uh, and being able to do contact tracing will be a part of that. Okay, I have a few questions from Kate Payne at Iowa Public Radio. Uh, can you update us on the county's contact tracing process? Uh, the same as uh, before that we mentioned. Uh, we're continuing to make contact with positive cases and their household contacts. And how many staffers are working on this? Uh, right now, there are to a total of four disease prevention specialists working on uh, case investigations with uh, three additional support staff working with various parts of that workflow. So a total of seven. Um, and on average, how long does it take to trace a person's contacts? Highly dependent on the situation. Uh, it could be a quick conversation if people uh, are able to recollect their whereabouts and what they've done. Obviously, with the community mitigation measures in place, it's uh, a little bit easier because everyone's uh, either at home or making their essential trips. So, um, Another one from Kate Payne at Iowa Public Radio. How are language interpreters involved in this process when needed and provides in interpretation? Uh, we utilize the service of the health department as well as uh, other translation uh, materials. Okay, and this is a follow-up from Kate Payne. Um, for contact tracing, has the definition of close contact changed? And please explain how it may have changed. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, you're referring to if it has changed recently. I know that what we're looking at is um, household contacts primarily and then others who have uh, spent a prolonged amount of time with those individuals. So uh, by those instances, with uh, if they've uh, been over at their house for a prolonged period of time, uh, but primarily, it is household contacts. Here's one from uh, Travis Breeze with KWWL. Can you share anything about contract tr tracing with UHIC or UIHC healthcare employees? Uh, as always, and as we've mentioned before, we keep that confidential. Uh, you know, we would refer those questions to our hospital partners. Yeah. Does it, uh, so based on that, does it look like these cases on the university campus could be tied to one location or are they community? Uh, right now, there's no concerns of that. Again, I would defer uh, those questions to the university. Uh, we have a question from Michael O'Brien at KCRG. What are your thoughts and what does the preparation timeline look like in regards to responding to a second wave of the virus? Uh, again, I, like I said, pretty early to tell, um, but uh, enhanced testing and contact tracing will be a part of that. And here's a follow-up from Michael O'Brien at KCRG. How fre frequently are discussions happening regarding reopening businesses like we've seen in the state of Georgia? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, very few. Uh, right now, we're still in the, the escalation phase of all of this. So uh, like, I, like I said, it's, it's pretty early on right now to, to imagine what that might look like. But I'm sure uh, many partners at the state and federal level are looking at that. So it looks like those are the questions that we've received for you, Sam. But uh, again, given the video lag, we'll give it a couple seconds. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Sam. All right. Thank you. All right, now we have Kate Klafstad, Clinical Services Manager with Johnson County Public Health. Thank you, Kelly. We are aware that individuals and family in our community are experiencing increasing financial strain during this pandemic. We want to ensure that the community is aware of resources available to help you through this difficult time. 
Even if you have not used local, state, or federal assistance in the past, you may be eligible to take advantage of services and assistance now, especially if you've recently lost income. So I want to give you a little bit of information about a few services and programs that are available to those who qualify. The first is WIC, available through the Johnson County WIC Clinic at Johnson County Public Health. The Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, provides nutritious food, baby formula, nutrition education, and breastfeeding support. The food provided by WIC is accessed at local groceries with a benefit card. WIC is for low-income pregnant women, breastfeeding and postpartum women, and children up to age 5. You can work and still get WIC. Eligibility is based on income and family size. You can continue to get cash assistance or SNAP benefits, food stamps, while receiving WIC. As a matter of fact, if you receive SNAP or are on Medicaid, you automatically qualify for WIC. You can get WIC even if you are not a citizen. For anyone concerned about public charge, WIC is not included in public charge, and families can feel safe in utilizing WIC even if they are not a citizen. You can find eligibility information on our website at johnson-county.com forward slash WIC, W-I-C. You can call the Johnson County WIC Clinic to sign up or ask questions. That number is 319-356-6042. We're completing all visits by phone to keep families and staff safe and physically distant. Another benefit that you might be eligible for is SNAP benefits or food stamps. It provides financial assistance to purchase groceries at supermarket markets, excuse me, grocery stores, farmers markets once those open up again. And you can find out more at dhs.iowa.gov. Finally, if you've experienced a change in your insurance coverage, you might be eligible for programs like Medicaid or Hawkeye. Medicaid is a health insurance program based on income that provides comprehensive coverage, including dental coverage for children. You can see if you qualify and sign up for Medicaid by visiting dhs.iowa.gov. And Hawkeye provides health and dental coverage for children of working families. The income eligibility guidelines are slightly higher for Hawkeye than for Medicaid, so if you don't qualify for Medicaid, you might qualify for Hawkeye. No family pays more than $40 per month, and some families don't pay any premiums at all. Dental-only coverage is available if you have health insurance but not dental insurance. If you live in Johnson or Iowa counties and have children under the age of 21, call us for help in determining if you or your family qualifies for Medicaid or hockey. We're happy to talk you through that. The number to call is 319-325-2781. These are just a few of the resources available to the community. You can visit our Johnson County website at johnson-county.com slash COVID, C-O-V-I-D, for a list of other resources, including emergency financial assistance programs available. We recognize that families are under a lot of strain right now, and we are so proud of how the community has come together to support each other to get through this together. We could use your help now in getting the word out to families who may need these resources. Thank you, and I'll take any questions that you have. So Kate, uh, in particular with uh, WIC benefits, uh, you know, typically in the past, you have had in-person visits and and those types of things. Uh, How would someone access those benefits? Um, Say someone who's new, how exactly do they receive those WIC benefits since nothing's being done in person anymore? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. We're doing everything by phone. And like I mentioned, the the actual benefits are on a card. So we're doing a curbside pickup, or we're happy to put that in the mail for you. We will make sure that you get it in a a physically distant and safe way. Um, And all you need to do is call us. So if you're wondering about eligibility, um, other detailed information, go to our website. If you just want to speak to a person, please give us a call. It's 356-6042. We're happy to talk you through it. We do have a little bit of a lag with the video, so we're going to give it a sec. All right. Thank you very much.
All right, and now we have Lynette Jacoby, Social Services Director for Johnson County. Good afternoon. I know these are challenging times and many Johnson County residents are experiencing economic hardships. As always, our community has rallied together to help ensure that support is available to those in need. I wanted to take the opportunity to share some of the resources that may assist households with bridging the financial gap. The Johnson County General Assistance Program is one of those programs that offers rent assistance, utility assistance, and assistance with um, meeting um, non-food vouchers, medications uh, for those households that are eligible. Eligibility varies, uh, but for more information on this program and um, to contact uh, somebody to complete an application, contact 319-356-6090 or visit our website at www.johnson-county.com forward slash SS. Uh, we're taking all applications by telephone now or via email. Uh, additional local resources offering emergency assistance for various needs include the United Way of Johnson County, uh, community Disaster Fund. Uh, emergency assistance is available for rental assistance, utilities, and other needs um, families have identified during the COVID crisis. Community Crisis Services is also accepting applications and services for um, rental assistance and other emergency needs. Applications are accepted Monday morning between 9 and 11 a.m. The Low Income House Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program provides financial assistance for heating bills for eligible applicants. The application deadline has been extended for this program until May 31st. For more, for more information and to complete an application, call HACAP at 319-739-0100. Additionally, the Iowa Department of Human Services offers a, a several assistance programs. Uh, you just heard Kate talk about SNAP benefits and Medicaid. Additionally, uh, the Iowa Department of Human Services provides assistance for child care and cash assistance through the Family Investment Program. To apply, uh, visit dhs.iowa.gov forward slash how dash to dash apply or contact the local DHS office at 319-356-6050 for assistance with an application. Another great partnership in our community uh, involves the four area food pantries that have teamed together to provide delivery throughout all of Johnson County. Households in need can contact the central delivery request line at 319-519 6165, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Delivery is generally made within 48 hours of a request. Seniors who are needing uh, uh, food assistance, uh, those 60 years and older, may receive uh, frozen meals delivered to their home once weekly through the Horizons Meals on Wheels program. For more information on that program, visit um, or contact 319 338-0515. I've provided a lot of numbers and a lot of websites here. So rest assured that this is all posted and available on the Johnson County Social Services webpage. Um, again, that website is www.johnson-county.com forward slash SS. There you'll find a listing of many additional local food resources, along with the financial supports mentioned here today. On that website, you'll also find the Johnson County Resource Directory, which is a comprehensive directory of social service supports in our community. There's also a weekly jobs list that contains local employment opportunities, and this is updated weekly. Individuals needing assistance, identifying and accessing ne necessary services may reach out to the Johnson County Social Services Navigator, Steve Nicasel. Uh, and Steve can be reached at 319-356-6090. 
we, I, I encourage folks to continue to check back to this website. We'll update uh, these flyers on a regular basis. Um, the services and resources available are changing rather frequently, uh, and so we anticipate there'll be additional supports and, um, forthcoming. Thank you. I'll take any questions at this time. This question is from Sarah Watson at the Daily Iowan. She actually has a couple questions. One, could you give us an idea of how many people are applying for some of these assistance programs? With Johnson County General Assistance, um, our, uh, the assistance program offered through the county, uh, we have not really, really seen an uptick yet in services. Uh, we serve approximately um, 900 households annually. Um, and so I've not really checked to see this last week. We've not really seen an uptick. So that's why we really want to make sure that folks are aware that this resource is available. Um, we're here to offer supports for folks. And so uh, we really hope that you all will help spread the word. The second question from Sarah. Are these resources like the Johnson County General Assistance Service available for students living off campus as well? Um, the, jo the general assistance program is not uh, available for uh, students. The other resources, however, I believe do um, provide assistance for students. So Lynette, you mentioned that social services is taking applications <clears throat> over the phone now, which is a little different. Uh, are there specific hours or, or days that days of the week that you're accepting those applications? Yep. And if so, could you give a little information right, on right. that? Right, right. You bet. So uh, our regular office hours are 8 to 4.30. Uh, staff are working remotely. However, um, they have everything at their fingertips. So uh, sometimes it requires a phone call. Uh, leaving a message and then um, the general assistance staff or the social services navigator will do a return phone call. Uh, if um, an individual doesn't have access to phone services, we can make accommodations to ensure that that phone call can get connected right away without uh, uh, the need to leave a message. Applications and documentation, um, we're uh, increasing our flexibility in terms of how that's submitted. Um, and we've also loosened some of our guidelines with regard to, for general assistance, regarding the need for job searches. Um, so we're really working uh, to adapt uh, our program and the requirements to assist as many households as possible right now. We're going to give it a second to see if we right. get any more questions. All right. Thank you. All right. Anna. Thank you. All right, wrapping things up, we have Dave Wilson, Director of Johnson County Emergency Management. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here again. Uh, this is day 45 of the response for Johnson County Emergency Management, Public Health, and the hospitals. And I'd just like to uh, reemphasize the partnerships have been key to this. Um, the preparedness all along has been good, and we've had that level of preparedness just because Johnson County is no stranger to disasters, both natural and, uh, you know, other types like H1N1, SARS, Ebola, all these other public health um, scares we've had in the past. Um, through that, we've developed a lot of partnerships like you've seen today with public health, social services, um, the three hospitals, you name it. School districts have been great to work with, et cetera. 
So we're at day 45 of this and we feel like things are going along pretty well. Um, are we shocked that we're seeing more positives? No. Are we um, alarmed by that? No, we're really not. Uh, we're using that barometer as our health care facilities so that we know what's going on in those long-term care centers and if we're having outbreaks in those or not, and uh, what's going on in our hospitals if they're um, unable to keep up with the patient load, and, and that's not the case here locally. So again, all of our partners have stepped up to the, gr to the plate, done a great job responding to this, and uh, to that end, we want to say thank you. Uh, I'd also like to recognize the people that we don't normally interact with, the business community, uh, Think Iowa City, uh, some of those uh, volunteer groups that have come out of the woodwork to make um, surgical masks, reusable ones for the folks at home, folks at the hospitals and in nursing homes. Um, the people have done surgical gowns, the people have done face shields, New Boco, Iowa City Fab Lab, the wineries they have started making hand sanitizer, you name it. Uh, people have shown their resilience and their community spirit by stepping up as Johnson County citizens and Iowa citizens and Americans and just coming out of the woodwork to help solve problems. And in any situation like that, that's what we need is problem solvers and people with a positive can-do attitude. And, and uh, we've been no stranger to that here in Johnson County. And I just want to say to everybody watching at home, thanks. We appreciate it. Uh, it's a team effort, and we're all in this together. And sometimes your biggest contribution is just, you know, staying at home, hanging out until this passes, especially if you're in one of the risk categories. So um, I'll take any questions with that. And I uh, just wanted to thank everyone. Dave, uh, Johnson County was a little ahead of things in terms of supply that, that we had available. Um, and it seems like a common question uh, from our reporters is how, how we're doing on supplies and if there's anything uh, new that we're seeing, uh, that, that we're needing, that we're short on, if you could give a little update on that. Sure. It seems like uh, most of the healthcare facilities, both nursing homes and hospitals, have gotten to the point where they're good on reusable face shields. Um, we still kind of have a, an up and down day with gowns, um, just infection control isolation gowns. We'll go a few days, two or three, and everybody will be fine on gowns. Then we'll uh, have somebody say, hey, I need 100 or 500 gowns. So gowns still continue to be a kind of an up and down thing. Um, masks, N95 masks, KN95 masks, those types of things. Uh, again, another one of those deals that ebbs and flows. There's been a lot of effort put into decontaminating and recleaning, reusing those, but uh, certainly we can use um, any N95 masks uh, that people run across. Um, but for the most part, we have never ran out completely. We've never had anyone call us and say, hey, I'm completely out. We've had people say we're getting low, or our projection in two or three days is that we might be out. So um, our supply lines have been good, but that problem kind of ebbs and flows. But those are our most frequent things. Dave, we've got a question here from Travis Breeze with KWWL. Uh, KWWL, they're still getting questions in their newsroom about the virus peak in Iowa. Is that something uh, that the EMA or anyone in Johnson County is trying to forecast? So we're not. Uh, we're following the tools that are used at the federal level. Um, I think everybody kind of relies on that one that's been developed on the state of Washington. They look at that a lot. Um, there's several others that have been out there as well. We're looking to State Department of Public Health, CDC, and Health and Human Services to do that. They have much more capability and a much uh, greater global uh, picture of that than we do locally. Yeah, do you know what matrix they're using to develop that uh, estimate for a peak? I, I do not, at? actually. I do not. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everyone. So that concludes our press conference uh, for today. Thank you again to everybody who participated, for the reporters who uh, sent in questions, for our community partners, uh, and for those tuning in. Uh, our next scheduled press conference will be next Tuesday at 1 p.m., and it, wa it will be broadcast uh, live on Johnson County Public Health Facebook and City Channel 4's YouTube. Thank you.